Hey everybody, K7 here uh, with my first Magic the Gathering Arena video. Um, I actually recorded a full video of the deck that I'm going to be breaking down right now, uh, but the audio was a little bit messed up, so <clears throat> I'm just going to cut the audio out and then I will just kind of talk through all the decisions. Uh, I only have one game recorded, but it actually ended up being a very long game. Um, and I figure uh, it was against a deck that I believe was a Luka Agent of Treachery deck. And, you know, the Luka, the the Yorian deck that's going out there that's uh, one of the big heavy hitters in the meta right now. If you're playing on the ranked ladder at all, you'll probably be seeing it a lot. Um, so it ended up being a very, very long game, probably about 20 minutes. Uh, so I might, I might do it two times just so it's faster, but I figure, you know, it's a good place where I can just kind of talk about the overall meta, kind of do a little bit of a meta discussion, and then also just kind of talk you through the decisions that I was making and discuss why I was making those decisions. Um, so the, the deck that I've been playing recently, or, or this deck that I have been playing recently that I've really been enjoying is a Niv-Mizzet Reborn deck. Um, I have two versions, one that's an 80 card version that I might do a, a kind of a gameplay and deck tech video for at some point later. Uh, this is the 60 card version. Um, it, what it really hinges around is Fires of Invention and Niv-Mizzet Niv Reborn. Fires of Invention is really kind of the tool that will allow you to play a lot of these uh, cards without having to pay the actual mana cost, because obviously the mana here is just absolutely a nightmare. Um, a lot of times I'm finding <clears throat> that my starting hand, I'll have you know a lot of tools and toys that I want to be able to utilize in my starting hand, but I won't be able to because the mana that I have in my starting hand doesn't match the mana that's required to play any of these uh, cards. So that's one problem with the deck that I've been finding. Um, another is I think the top end could use a trim. I don't think Kenrith really has a place here. I think I could totally cut him out, replace him with something, maybe another Elspeth Conquers Death. Uh, another card I think that could use a trim in this deck is Elspeth Conquers Death because it doesn't have... Um, the trigger with Niv Mizzet Re Reborn, where Niv Mizzet only really triggers cards that have a uh, cards that have a color pair, where Elspeth Conquers Death obviously does not have a pairing. It is only the white co uh, casting cost. Um, so, I feel like the upper end of this deck could use a trim, and the lower end of this deck. I mean, there are things that could fix the mana in this deck, like what's it called? <clears throat> the Lantern, I believe it is, Chromatic Lantern. Yeah, Chromatic Lantern. I mean, I could put four of these in here, but and it would actually probably not be so bad. The reason I don't have it is, one, I don't have any copies of it, and two, I don't want to buy any copies of it because this is a Guilds of Ravnica card, which is going to be rotating um, at the time of this video. It is May 16th, uh, so this card will be rotating in, what, four months? So spending four wild cards where I really don't, I only have one rare right now, spending four rare wild cards on something I won't probably be using in a couple months doesn't sound so great and I say that having bought all of the dual lands recently but it's neither here nor there but uh, I feel like this on the lower end if you had four copies of this would make the deck a lot stronger especially in the early stages of the game having this out there just you know if you don't have the fires of invention which I don't know what is going on with the hand smoothing in this deck but I am you know in in decks like a, a classical Jeskai fires uh, meta deck or in that gruel fires deck I always seem to be able to find a fires of invention in the first or you know in the first mulligan if if not in my starting hand uh, in this deck they elude me I don't know what it is about you know what it is about the the this mix of cards um, but it is never in my starting hand and never in my next uh, mulligan and I never seem to draw it uh, in this exact game that you're about to watch I actually don't draw a single Fires of Invention until I have 26 cards left in my library. So, I mean, Niv, I cast recast Niv-Mizzet a bunch of times, so maybe it was just getting caught up in those draw 10 and then getting shuffled to the bottom of the library. But, I mean, that is just incredibly unlucky. Um, so potentially that's, a, that's another problem, is if you don't have Fires you know, to start with, you could just be cycling it to the bottom of your library every time you cast, cast Niv-Mizzet re, uh, Reborn. And obviously in a meta where we have things like Elspeth Conquers Death, where we have Teferi, where, you know, things are getting bounced back to your hand and you're replaying this, uh, you know, Niv-Mizzet Reborn is a, is a card that is just problematic in, it, in its nature. I mean, obviously with the casting cost of every single kind of mana and... Um, 
and looking at those top 10 cards, I mean, it, it, it is riddled with issues and <laughs> being somewhat unplayable, but it's just such a fun card and it does add so much value being able to look at the top 10 cards and then finding something, finding an answer, any, any combination, any number of combination, color combinations of answers, which we have tons of, we have casualties of war, we have time wipe, we have mortify, we have Teferi, growth, growth spiral isn't really an answer to anything, but Angrath's rampage, tyrant scorn, D spark. So we have tons of answers that we can draw a lot of value that we can draw from when we put Niv Mizzet on the battlefield. Um, and the reason, I mean, obviously the reason we have so much of this just bleh in the lower end, you know, all our two and three drops, the reason that we have all these color combinations and the reason that the mana is so screwy is because we want to be drawing these when we put Niv Mizzet on the battlefield. We want to be able to hit, you know, when we draw 10 cards off the top of our library, we want to have some of these answers so that, you know, in the time it took us to get Niv Mizzet down, they probably were doing things. Uh, we want to be able to find answers to that. Uh, we have Shatter the Sky, we have Storm's Wrath, and we have Time Wipe. Those are things that we can use to kind of clear up the board because inevitably, you know, it's going to take us time to build up our board to be able to get niv it down to find our answers. So those are really just kind of um, catch-alls. Uh, you know, if they've established, especially in aggro decks, I mean, this this deck doesn't really stand a chance against aggro decks. <clears throat> but, you know, if you do have a Shatter the Sky, a Storm's Wrath, a Time Wipe in your starting hand... Um, and you have the mana to cast it, it, it can really help and could, could kind of save you. Um, if you can hear that meowing, that is my cat. He is upset. I think he wants to be let out. So I'm going to go do that real quick. All right, back. Sorry about that. I guess lastly, um, the last thing I want to talk about regarding the deck uh, is the mana base. So I have 26 lands. Um, and... In those lands, I have pretty much two of every single kind of dual land. Um, I have a Ketria Triome because I don't want too many tapped um, lands that have to come in tapped. Um, two Fabled Passages because, again, you know, if you get a Fabled Passage in your starting hand and, you know, you don't draw into too many lands, it's kind of a feels-bad situation. Uh, and then I have pretty much one of every single kind of basic land. I just, you know, I had to kind of throw in a few here and there um, like you know I don't have exactly two copies of every single one of these because you know maybe I don't actually have two copies of every single one of these and um, I added you know two copies here and there because it really doesn't make a huge difference but um, you know the more untapped lands we have obviously the better the more color combinations that we have the better um, and then you know you leave yourself some some wiggle room down here with you know, the Ketria Triumph and a few other things. You know, if you are if you have a Ketria Triumph in your, in your starting hand, it's not the worst thing in the world, but later on, you know, the cycling ability could have some could have some use, but more than likely you're just playing this tapped on the battlefield um, and giving yourself the option of having one of those three colors, which could potentially help you at, at some point. Um, an argument could be made to throw in more Triomes in here. Um, I don't hate that idea, but I just do hate the idea of having tapped lands for this deck. Um, I hate tapped lands, everybody hates tapped lands, but, uh, you know, especially in a deck that is so mana crazy, Triomes would probably be pretty strong. Um, I just find that, especially in this deck, you know, in my, I, again, I have that 80 card uh, niv Mizzet Reborn deck, um, and in that one I run a lot more Triome lands. Um, I just found, you know, I was playing with this one with a lot of Triome lands to begin with, and it was just too slow. You, you drawing into Triome after Triome after Triome was really, really shitty. Uh, so that's why I, I don't have a lot of those. But anyway, yeah, so that's the deck, and uh, we'll move right on into the gameplay. Again, the original audio was a little screwed up, so I'm just going to be, you know, if, if it doesn't seem natural uh, or anything, it's because the audio is going to be me recording over that gameplay footage after the fact, after the game has already been played. Uh, so I'll be kind of following along with you. I don't remember, obviously, everything that happened in the game, but I remember kind of the, the highlights. Um, but it was overall a pretty good game, and uh, we can talk kind of about the meta. You know, if there's quiet moments, I'll probably be talking about the meta and kind of how frustrating it is right now. Um, and then kind of the decisions that I'm making, why I'm making them, and things like that. So, yeah, we'll get right into the match. Alright, so to start out, 
uh, I guess really what I'm going to be doing is trying to make as few edits to this uh, audio as possible, so not starting and stopping too much, probably just trying to go right on through it. But uh, as you can see, the starting hand, not great, but uh, drawing uh, into two nibs is, is pretty tough. But what I did like about this hand is we had the mana for Teferi, we had the mana for Shatter the Sky, uh, and that is rarely something you ever really see. Uh, <laughs> with this deck because the mana is so screwy because you have so many random cards with color combinations it's hard to get uh, your mana just right but seeing this hand having kind of all the mana just just right to cast those two cards specifically uh, was amazing so the first thing I did was get Teferi out to bounce uh, a token you might ask why you know a token is that important it's a 1-1 one -one. what are you so scared of um, I believe that this deck was a Yorian Luka deck it obviously has Yorian as their companion and the Yorian Luka Agent of Treachery is just really, it's all over the ladder right now. It's, I mean, it's everywhere. It includes Fires of Invention. So uh, I wanted to make the board clear of those tokens. Hopefully he didn't have another way to play more tokens. Um, and as long as I keep those tokens off the board, his Luka pretty much meant nothing. Um, because really the, the purpose of Luka in those decks is to get agent of treachery on the board quickly and the last thing i needed him doing is taking away the lands that i needed so desperately um so i figured i mean right now i literally use a shadow of the sky on a one one token um but i just wanted to keep that agent of treachery wanted to keep that luca away from my lands because the last thing i needed especially when i'm trying to uh especially when my mana base is so delicate is to lose lands um and you'll see here, you know, he, he builds up a pretty, pretty awesome board presence with Narset, with Teferi. I think he gets a second Narset down. Um, but we play it smooth, we play it slow, uh, and I think we end up getting a lot of the answers we need to really be able to kind of keep him at bay. So he builds up a really strong Planeswalker board presence, but I knew that keeping those tokens off the board meant that he wasn't going to be able to play his, his win con, which, again, was Agent of Treachery and Yorian, so... Um, he sacrifices Omen here, so I know he's digging for things. I know he's looking for Luca. I know he's looking for Agent. The weird thing is I never saw Luca come down, um, so I don't know if maybe this his deck didn't have a Luca in it. Um, but usually when they have Omen of the Sun, uh, Luca is present. Um, but I knew the things that I wanted to target next. Obviously, the Narset, him being able to gain life, uh, would be a little bit of a problem. Um, but his Teferi, really not a huge deal for me. Um, you know, if he bounces my Niv-Mizzet Reborn, that's just more value for me. Uh, you know, if he bounces that back, I'm just finding more answers every time he does. So, uh, Narset is kind of the biggest target for me right now. Um, but it is a little bit of a, a, a tough play because I figured, you know, the more lands he gets, the closer he's, he's getting to Luka, the closer he's getting to Agent. So, um, you know, I had to figure out a way to kind of play around that. Uh, if he took Niv-Mizzet Reborn, I had the Casualties of War ready. I had the Mortify ready, as you can see there. Um, but I think what I end up doing is and I end up using the Casualties of War and the Mortify to kind of clear up the um, the Planeswalker. So as you can see right there, he bounced my Niv-Mizzet Reborn, which is kind of what I was hoping he would do um, because it lets me replay it. It lets me look for more answers, which I desperately needed more of because you know he has a board presence with two strong Planeswalkers. Uh, and I have a cleared board with not a lot of mana on the board, so um, him bouncing that niv it was actually kind of a little bit of a favor to me. Uh, I think what I end up doing is getting rid of the Fires of Invention. Uh, it's just a way for him to play, you know, multiple threats. You know, he could play a Luka and an Agent uh, if he wanted to. I don't know why he would, but, you know, without those tokens on the board, um, he has no other way to. So really, I guess it was just uh, preventing him from using Luca, but um, getting rid of that fires him and mentioned now, you know, he's he's slowed down significantly. He can only pretty much play one of his answers or one of his win cons at a time. So him getting Narset down is pretty huge. Let's him dig for dig for those win cons now. Again, getting rid of that fires him and mentioned was pretty huge for me. Uh, it allowed him to only be playing one of his win cons at a time. So you see, he just dug. He found another win con in Shark Typhoon. Um, which we have the casualties of war all set and ready to go for. So um, that's what, I mean, that's just where the kind of the value of Niv, Niv Mizzet Reborn uh, kind of shines and, you know, kind of where I think his mistake in bouncing it back to my hand was made. He doesn't know that I have another in my hand, but if, you know, if he didn't, 
or if even if I didn't have a have another Niv Mizzet in my hand, having that first one bounce back to my hand to look for more answers, I mean it was it really was he was doing me a favor there. So um, if I were him, I would have targeted zero and just gone for the card draw. Uh, but he did me a favor, uh, and now I can take care of um, his other Narset uh, and take care of one land. I went for the Rogger and Triome because I figure uh, it's versatile. It gives him versatility, and if I get rid of that, that gets rid of one of his whites, and then if I obviously uh, draw into another Casualties of War, I actually have one in my hand, I can get rid of that other white mana, so he has no white mana, which would hopefully prevent an Elspeth Conqueror's death, but I think here he goes and fetches a white, and I think he gets rid of my Teferi with an Elspeth Conqueror's death, so I was one turn away, unfortunately. But as you can see, I did draw an Elspeth Conqueror's death, so I had an answer to that immediately, which was nice. Um, at this point, I'm thinking of playing Uro. I'm getting a little nervous about an Agent of Treachery. Um, obviously, if, he, if his Agent of Treachery takes my Teferi, that's not a huge deal. Um, but at this time, I don't even think I was thinking about Elspeth Conquer's death, so I was just kind of playing it safe, playing Uro, get the life gain, get the card. Uh, it gets sacrificed, so I don't have to worry about it being stolen. Um, get the land on the battlefield. Uh, and then I can always just replay Niv at this point, look for answers. So if he does steal, uh, again, I don't think I was thinking about the Elspeth Conqueror's death. Um, I really should have put two and two together, five mana um, and two planes. I don't know, maybe he drew into it, I'm assuming, because he didn't play it that turn. He went and fetched the planes and then didn't play anything and left all that mana open. Um but I know I wasn't nervous about counterspells because I think the Luka Agent Treachery decks, I don't think they play counterspells. They might play Mystical Dispute, but I don't I don't play those decks. I find them incredibly annoying and boring. Um, but, you know, that's if, if you want to play that, that's that's your speed. But um, I just, I don't, uh, as far as, you know, I, I think it's a powerful deck. I think that that idea was really cool. But um, just seeing, I, I guess, you know, it's... Having to play that deck all the time is really what gets me uh, super salty about it. I mean, it's just, it is super powerful, and I thought the idea of the deck was really cool, but once you come up and play it three, four, five times going up the ladder and just seeing your lands get stolen or just seeing all your threats and answers get stolen, it's it's just super frustrating. It makes you just want to go out there and just play Fires of Invention or something and, or aggro and just get, get people killed. Uh, anyway, so... He goes ahead and he plays his Shark Typhoon for full mana, which was great. Or actually, he plays, yeah, he played the Shark Typhoon as an uh, enchantment. He didn't even go for the actual shark itself, which was awesome for me because it let me get rid of it. Uh, I think we target, um, it didn't really matter at this point what land we targeted, but I think I was still going for the whites to try to prevent the Elspeth Conqueror's death. Uh, he had three on the board there, so, I mean, I think, we, I know we end up being a little bit too late, but... Um, I sacrifice the Teferi here just to get the card draw. I have the other one in the hand. He knows about it, so I might as well. Um, if I don't replay Teferi here, I should have. Okay, so I did replay Teferi here. I uh, used all my mana, being just mana efficient overall. Um, and then we kind of get ourselves set up for whatever he has in hand next turn. What I'm really trying to do is not play out my threats so he can't steal them, uh, and not play out my threats, because at this point I, I think I was thinking about Elspeth Conqueror's death, that's why I was targeting the white lands. Um, so I'm trying to play around those things, but eventually, at, at a certain point, you know, even against, you know, counterspell heavy decks, you know, if you're playing a Simic Flash deck or anything like that, eventually you're going to have to start playing things. You can't just let their hand build up and start discarding cards on your end, so... Um, I eventually was going to have to stop playing around that, but this is exactly what I wanted to see. I wanted to him to Elspeth Conqueror's Death my Teferi, and then I wanted to Elspeth Conqueror's Death his Elspeth Conqueror's Death. Uh, that card is just so strong. Uh, probably, I'd say probably my favorite card. I mean, I would say it's, it, I would say it was underrated when it first, when Theros first came out, um, but obviously it became super rated. Uh, that, that, that card is just incredible. Um, but that was the best thing I could have asked for, is him, Elspeth conquering death, my Teferi, and then me, Elspeth conquering death, his Elspeth conquers death. Um, now at this point, again, I'm still playing around Agent, I'm still trying to play around um, more Elspeth conquers death, so I'm just playing out an Uro, um, 
maybe should have just played the Niv Mizzet because an Elspeth Conquers Death on my Niv Mizzet would be less painful than an Elspeth Conquers Death on my Uro because getting rid of an Uro um, is pretty brutal. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, he did, and I forgot to mention this earlier, he did ultimate one of his Narset, so anytime he plays a, uh, a non-creature spell, I take two damage. But it ended up not it ended up not really being too big of a factor. I, maybe he probably should have left the Narset on the board so that he could have just kept gaining the two life. Um, but I don't think I think he thought he, he was uh, he had it in the bag because he had a board presence that was just super strong at the beginning. Uh, but you know, even after he gets the Elspeth conquers death on the board, I don't want that to stay on the board because he could get back a Teferi, he could get back a Narset, he could get back um, the other Narset. Uh, so I used a Casualties of War to get rid of that, and again, I targeted his white mana because I didn't want him to have that. As you can hear, my cat Krieger is uh, hanging out, <laughs> and he is meowing for some attention, so. All right. So we get to a point where our hand is full. We need to discard something. Since I already have the two niv I figure I can discard a niv and I also have the option... Uh, where that Elspeth Conquers Death could bring that niv mizzet back with a plus one, plus one counter. So um, discarding that niv mizzet not the biggest deal. Uh, also, another reason why I chose that card to um, to discard is uh, having too many in the hand and playing them too often. And he was bouncing my, you know, my niv mizzets a lot. So by him doing that, you know, I'm digging through my deck, doing the top ten cards. I figured that was one of the reasons we weren't drawing into Fires of Invention. So... Uh, discarding that would prevent us from replaying it a bunch, but um, I really, really was happy with this play. Uh, I was trying to force him to play that Yorian before he wanted to play it, and he was just trying to play it as a blocker, which was perfect. And then, as you saw, I had drawn out the uh, D-Spark, so I was able to exile Yorian, which is exactly what I wanted to do to that, because the last thing I need is him to get that back with an Elspeth Conqueror's Death or something. I didn't want it in his graveyard, and I wanted it somewhere where he could never get it again. Um, and I had a two mana answer to a, what is Yorian, a five or six mana spell, so, or a five, six mana creature. Um, so I thought that was mana efficiency at its finest. And then we're able to swing in with Niv Mizzet for the first time and get that sweet six damage. Um, and now we're at a point where I am scared of the agent, and lo and behold, here's where it pops out. But thank God we have the Tyrant Scorn to bounce. Uh, Niv Mizzet back into our hand. The only problem, um, I really should have waited for him to target Niv Mizzet before I played that, because then he would have just gotten nothing. Uh, so he ends up getting my Teferi, which in the end, not a huge deal, because we have the Casualties of War, which he doesn't know about, uh, my opponent doesn't know about. Um, so we can just get rid of my Teferi, which is a little unfortunate, but we also get rid of his Agent of Treachery, so he won't be able to blink that if he has Thassa or any other way to blink it. Uh, and we get rid of his Castle Arden Veil, so he can't create any 1-1 one -one tokens for blocking uh, purposes. But again, I'm just trying to keep that white mana as constricted for him as possible, because I do not want to see Elspeth Conquer's death exiling more of my stuff. But I think it ends up happening anyway, but what are you going to do? So he ends up playing a Shatter the Sky here, which is not a huge deal for us. Um, getting rid of a Niv Mizzet, you know, if I, if I ended up drawing into another Elspeth, I could bring it back. But we have more Niv in our hand, and... Mourniv is happy us, so. He plays an Omen of the Sea. I can see he's digging for answers, and I think he scries two to the top, which made me a little bit nervous. Um, but the value, and as you can see, I did eventually draw into the fires, but at this point I think we had already, um, I think we only had like 26 cards left in our deck, so that Fires of Invention was super late to the party. Um, and I don't think we end, ever ended up playing it because we already had enough mana where we could play multiple threats in a turn. Uh, either that or we just didn't have enough threats in our hand that cost it enough. Uh, you know, we have the Growth Spiral, the Angress Rampage, and Time Wipe and all that. But So at this point, I'm really just looking to close out the game, uh, play my threats, put a board presence out there that he has to answer, regardless of whether or not he plays... Uh, uh, an agent of treachery and starts taking my things I just need, you know, we're at a point in the game my library is starting to diminish I just need to start getting things out there and putting pressure on him, getting pressure on the board, getting damage done um, and seeing what answers he has left he has three cards left in his hand you know, I am scared of a, of a shatter the sky I am scared of 
an agent of treachery, but um, you know, I, ju- I just got to start closing out this game. So he plays a Fires of Invention. He has one spell left to play. Um, I don't remember what it is, but you know, immediately he gets that Fires out, and I know the next move I want to make is play my Teferi so I can bounce that Fires back into his hand and make him replay it, because the more I can keep his mana busy at the end of this game, the better. I think here he targets the Niv-Mizzet, which if I were him, I would have targeted the Uro, because that can just keep coming back. Niv-Mizzet, um, you know, it's a it's a one-time answer for him. But he targets the Niv-Mizzet, not particularly sure why. He probably had, you know, things that could block Uro, so he had he could give himself more time. But, um, you know, at this point in the game, I think it's it's already too late, but... One big issue that I saw here is the Elspeth Conqueror's death in two more turns was going to get something back from the graveyard, which, you know, uh, he could have gotten a Narset back, he could have gotten the other Narset back, or he could have gotten uh, Yorian back, he could have gotten Agent of Treachery back, so all of those things I don't want to see happen. So um, I obviously, you know, if I play Teferi, uh, I'm not going to be bouncing that Elspeth Conqueror's death, I don't want to be able to exile more of my things, but... If I play Teferi, bounce the fires, that's just one more thing he has to spend mana on next turn. So, um, And it would restrict him to, after fires, only being able to play one more spell. So bounce the fires, make him have to replay that. And what I'm doing, uh, uh, also I was digging, really, with Teferi. Uh, that one card I needed to be Elspeth Conquer's Death, and it wasn't. Uh, and I don't think I draw into it, but I think I'm able to put threats on the board to close the game out. Um, so... Um, all I'm trying to do at the end of this game now is, again, establish the board presence, trying to get damage in to close out the game, uh, and right now my biggest problem is not having an answer to the Elspeth Conqueror's death, and I think the only answer that I do have uh, is Mortify, which is in the graveyard, and Elspeth Conqueror's death, so I'm just looking for that last Elspeth. So I swing in with the Uro 6-6, just trying to get damage. I luckily enough draw a land that I can play onto the battlefield. So I get the full value of that Uro, gain the three life. Um, and Angress Rampage kind of let me down because it's, you know, I sacrifice an artifact, not an enchantment, which would be fantastic if I could have made him sacrifice the, well, if, if I made him sacrifice an enchantment, he would have chosen the uh, Omen of the Sea, which sucks. But, you know, this is where having more diverse answers might be uh, a better idea rather than having Kenrith, rather than maybe having Elspeth Conquer's death, rather than having expensive answers, maybe putting more of the cheaper answers into the lower end of this deck might have been more beneficial. So he plays a Narset, and he starts digging, which again is a problem for us if he drew into an agent, that would kind of suck, Uh, but he draws into a Shatter of the Sky, which is a huge nightmare for us. That would have slowed the game down entirely, but, you know, because we made him dig for the Fires of Invention, and he, he only has the two spells, he played the Narset, he can't play the Fires of Invention. Or, I'm sorry, he can't play the Shatter of the Sky. He's already played his two spells, so that really it kind of spells the end of the game for him. Uh, so we go ahead and we swing in with both of our 6-6s. Six I was hoping to God that he didn't have some weird answer, but again, he actually had the Fires of Invention, so there's nothing he could have done. That was game. Um, Narset prevents us from drawing a card with Uro. Uh, but we do have the land in our hand, so we could play that. And that was the game. So, overall, um, you know, I think we played that pretty well. He It didn't look like he had Luka. Um, you know, maybe this was just a different Yorian deck that didn't include Luka. I thought, you know, with the Omen of the Sun, for sure he was going to be playing Luka. And, you know, was looking for Luka to then and attack with the one ones or exiling them. And then getting the Agent out and all that stuff. But... He didn't have Luka, but, you know, he did establish a very strong board presence at the beginning of the game, and I think we were able to kind of, um, you know, maybe I I was a little too aggressive with the 1-1s, but, you know, in the case that he was the classic Luka deck and he had that in his hand, um, I think clearing up those 1-1s, as aggressive as I was and spending a a Shadow of the Sky to get, you know, spending 4 mana on a Shadow of the Sky to get rid of a 1-1 token, although... uh, seems a little bit ridiculous and not super mana efficient um i think it was the right thing to do because if he did have the the luca we would have been in trouble very early Uh, but he does establish a very strong board presence and you know he has a lot of planeswalkers on the board and we're able to kind of clean everything up we're able to find the right answers that we need with uh niv mizzet we force him to play his yorian when he doesn't want to we're able to elspeth conquers death his elspeth conquers death 
uh, and then we're able to kind of fend off the answers that he has in his hand at the end of the game, you know, and force through our Uro, force through our niv uh and, and come to a close. It was very close. He was almost able to play Shadow of the Sky and clean up our board, but even after that, I think, you know, we had a Uro, we had a niv it left, so um, I think... I think he would have run out of answers, and I think we would have had a board presence left where we could have kind of dominated that game. So, uh, all all in all, uh, very I, I I think it was a lot of fun. But um, the meta is filled with these decks, these Yorian eighty card piles that have Agent of Treachery and have you know ways to blink him in and out of play and take all your stuff and take your lands. And it it is a cool deck. It is a cool idea. Uh, it's just frustrating to play against. Um, you know, just trying to think of ways to, you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's Agent of Treachery that's, that's broken. Um, you know, maybe it's, just, I mean, it's just the way that people are kind of mana cheating it so that they don't have to pay seven mana to get an Agent of Treachery on the board and then having multiple ways to get him off the board and then back onto the board. And, you know, the game has gotten to a point where there are just so many ways to, you know, bring something back and forth from the board off the board and just you know bring it back i think that you know maybe it, it agent of treachery is a fair card but and i feel like it shouldn't have to be changed i just, i feel like you know there are other things that are making that make it broken um but maybe it is maybe the card itself should be changed i mean they, they can't but you know what it, a change i would like to see is rather than it, when it enter it, it, rather than being an etb rather than being when it enters the battlefield gain control of target permanent maybe something more like when when this card is played from your hand so you know if it's cheated from the graveyard it would solve that problem uh if you know in the case of luca uh, but at that point you're just devaluing agent of treachery so much that it would be unplayable i mean who would play a seven mana card where when it's played from your hand only uh, and then it has value. So I don't think it's Agent of Treachery that's the problem. I mean, the card itself is the problem, uh, but it's it's the way people are creatively finding ways to play him, which I guess, in, you know, it's it's part of the game. You know, people are finding ways to play things for cheaper and, and all that, but, you know, when, when you're just trying to play a game of Magic and your opponent is taking your lands and preventing you from playing the game um, and... Or, or, you know, you establish a board presence, you're really, you know, happy and, you know, you're playing the game, you, 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 you have your jank or combo deck or your whatever fully realized and you're having a good time and then they just take everything by blinking Agent of Treachery like six times. Um, it, it's demoralizing and frustrating. And again, that is part of the game. You know, you, you come up against uh, a deck and, you, you you know, maybe you've been dominant the whole game and then they, they their combo goes off and then they totally flip flip it on its head and... Um, but I guess the point is, you know, if I'm playing a, a janky combo deck I haven't seen before and their combo goes off, I'm like, oh, like, even if I lose, I'm like, oh, that was awesome. And then when you watch this go off, it's just, a, it's, it's like the same thing as watching the, the cat oven, just people cycling that thing over and over and slowly watching your life dwindle to zero. Um, it's just a little frustrating. And when you, when you play it so much, I guess that's the problem is just everybody's playing it. Um, so it might be a good time to take a break from the ranked ladder, but you know, this game wasn't even in ranked. This was in uh, casual, so um, it's everywhere. Um, so you know, it might be a good time to just kind of take a break from the game and uh, and and not really. I mean, I'm not saying I'm going to be doing that, but for anybody else out there who's frustrated, it might be a good time to walk away from the game for a bit until the meta settles on something a little bit less frustrating to play, a little bit less frustrating to see. But you know, there are still things out there that are fun. It's just, you're just going to have to put up with, with playing that. And that's just the way it is. But all right. So the last thing I want to do is just kind of go over, uh, the deck, maybe kind of review, uh, the deck itself and kind of go over what changes I would, I think I will be making or, um, and I guess the, the overall, the deck's viability. So, um, overall, I mean, I really like, I, I love, Niv Mizzet, I love, you know, slamming him on the board, finding answers and things like that. So uh, the deck is fun to play. Uh, the frustrating the the frustrating parts of the deck are probably um, so things like Storm's Wrath, I would I would cut Storm's Wrath, uh, replace it with Deafening Clarion. Um, I just don't have the the rares right now uh, for Deafening Clarion, and again, Deafening is uh, is another card that's going to be rotating out in a couple months, so. 
Uh, just not a card I really want to spend rares on unless I absolutely have to. Um, so, you know, if, if, if you're looking at my deck list, the things I would immediately cut, if, if you have space for it, immediately cut Storm's Wrath, replace it with Deafening Clarion. Um, Sh Shadow of the Sky definitely does have a place. Um, you know, you do, you know, there are situations where you are going to need that, so I would leave Shadow of the Sky. Um, or maybe replace it for another Time Wipe, because Time Wipe actually has the color combo, so when Niv-Mizzet goes off, it's one of the things that you can fetch. Uh, so maybe cut Shatter the Sky and replace it with Time Wipe. Uh, cut Storm's Wrath, replace it with uh, Deafening Clarion. Elspeth Conquers Death uh, is actually pretty crucial. Although it doesn't have a color combination, it is just such a powerful card and such a such a great card. I mean, in the in the video you watched of me playing that game, um, you know we're able to Elsp we're able to ECD or Elspeth Conquers Death our opponent's Elspeth Conquers Death. Um, it's, uh, it's just such a good card. It's not something I would drop from this list. I mean, it is a five mana. Um, it is a five mana, you know, exile and then get something back, blah, blah, blah. So maybe you want to find something cheaper to replace it. Maybe only, uh, you know, you run two and then you, maybe you find something more like, you know, you find maybe more D sparks or something like that to kind of fill out this lower end of multicolored things. Um, but I would immediately just cut Kenrith and maybe, maybe that's what you do. You cut Kenrith, you replace him with a, a lower end. The, re the only reason I really have him is if you're able to get Fires of Invention out, you're able to get him out and you're able to get uh, Niv-Mizzet out. Um, and then you can use his, his one mana red ability to give everything trample and haste. Um, but you know, this deck isn't really about being aggressive. This isn't a replacement Jeskai Fires or anything like that by any means. So he really doesn't have a place here. So maybe cut Kenrith and then find a, a lower end, you know, exile or uh, something of that nature. Um, you know, maybe a two or three mana, something that uh, that's a, a small mana answer to something that might be a problem that's on the board. And that's really the only changes I would make. I mean, it, your mana base is pretty good. I, it, it, it's a nightmare, <laughs> but um, what I have here, you know, you'll probably... You, you'll definitely have what you need. It's just a matter of will it be in your opening hand or will you draw into it? Um, so, you know, maybe experimenting more with triomes, just, you know, maybe four of four triomes and, you know, one of each triome kind of thing. And, you know, you can trim around here and stuff like that. Um, but overall, it, it's a fun deck. When it goes off, it's great. And when it doesn't, it, it feels bad. But even, you know, in those in those games where it doesn't go off, you're probably just sitting there with the wrong mana and your opponent's attacking your face and the game end, ends pretty quickly. But um, when you're able to get the things out that you need, uh, it's, it's a really fun time. So uh, I would definitely recommend, um, you know, trying it out, playing or playing around um, and seeing how things go. Uh, it, you know, as far as its ranked viability, this is not a ranked viable deck. Um, I mean, I did come up against a top... Well, not top tier, but one of the top meta decks right now, the Lucan, a Luca Agent Yorian thing, uh, and I won. Uh, but that's just one example, and everything went really went right for us, and not everything went right for him. Um, well, I guess n not necessarily much went wrong. It's just everything that he had, we had an answer for, and that is not going to be the situation most of the time. So, um yeah, I, I mean, and also in the ranked ladder, you know, you're obviously you're not only playing the Luca Agent Yorian combo, you're also playing aggro decks, which this deck will will simply not survive against. So, uh, if you're on the ranked ladder, I would not be playing this deck. Um, but if you are not on the ranked ladder and you just want to kind of have some fun with some weird, I don't want to call this jank, but if you want to have some fun with some just a weird deck that has a lot of weird answers uh and when everything goes right it feels really good this is a great a great kind of deck for that so uh and i just love niv Re mizzet reborn i think that art is just fucking awesome and uh, just having to play all five colors is something that i don't really do that often because mana is a nightmare but you know it is what it is so yeah hopefully you enjoyed it and hopefully you know you can go out you can play this deck and let me know how it feels and if you like it and if it's fun so yeah thanks for watching